So welcome everybody to the uh, town board and the planning board work session. Thank you, planning board, for joining us. We're going to be talking about guidelines for small cell wireless facilities. And I would add, nice to get together without talking about chocolate crossing. <laughs> Different exactly. So, uh, okay. Sabrina has the floor. Okay, perfect. Well, as both boards are, you know, the town board is considering changes to the wireless um, law in the town code to incorporate small cell wireless that we are being faced with due to the FCC regulations. The one area that the town has been left in control of is aesthetics. So um, the, the draft guidelines that I sent to you are guidelines that were reviewed by myself and council. We reviewed them together in relation to the proposed changes to the wireless law that you are considering. Just to give you a sense, the guidelines in general are divided into two sections. There's the aesthetic section, which is by right under your purview, the town's purview. It would be under the planning board's purview per the local regulation. There are also um, locational guidelines. These are guidelines for applicants. The, we don't have a lot of control or um, authority over the location guidelines, but in speaking with council, it was thought to put these in here to give applicants a sense of our preference, to give a little more detail than the law gives. So, the, the language in here is, is softer when it comes to the location guidelines, and it's more um, restrictive when it comes to the aesthetic guidelines. And these aesthetic guidelines, the idea about issuing separate guidelines is that the code will reference the guidelines. We can change the guidelines much easier and more often than actually changing the legislation. So this document will become a changeable document moving forward. So if we find out that what we're asking for aesthetically is not possible, then we can change our guideline without affecting our law. One of the things when, when, as we were doing the research and talking to the industry professionals about small cell wireless, there isn't a lot of known technology out there. The technology is very different than what you see in a cell tower and an equipment compound. It's much smaller. We have been told, you know, that they don't need generators for example, associated with the small cell, that they're battery run, that they're smaller, that they can be concealed. So, so it's a, a much different type of technology when it comes to setting it in the environment that it's going in. So uh, I can go through each one of the, the aesthetic concerns that we have identified. There are, there's some repetition between the guidelines and the legislation. Yeah. And it's there purposefully. In our legislation, it means we want it, it's not a choice. We include it in the guidelines to make it easier for applicants to understand it's required and to make sure that they're consistent and carried through. Okay, one of the, one of the major points that is more predominant in the legislation has to do with double poles. If they're coming in to locate small cell wireless and there's a double pole condition, we are requiring that that second pole be removed. That is an aesthetic concern and it's something that we are, is within the legislation which has higher authority than the guideline. I have to tell you, Sabrina, that's also a real safety concern. The town board has been actually um, very active in working with the utilities to try to eradicate the proliferation of double poles, um, they really affect your sight line, yeah. um, especially along our main roads. Uh, Jeremy will certainly be one to uh, attest to the yeah. fact that along the Whipple Road. <laughs> there you go. You got so excited, you started running. <laughs> <laughs> something I said, something I did. But um, we, we've been very active in working with the utilities about um, trying to uh, hold their feet to the fire about getting rid of these double poles. Um, it is our understanding that by the terms of uh, authorization through the Public Service Commission, they are required through this engine's itinerary uh, inventory to um, eliminate them within a certain period of time. Unfortunately, because there is no uh, monetary penalty associated with failure to do so, it's all voluntary. Um, 
to say that their uh, compliance has been spotty is, is being kind. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so again, the intention of including it here is to really invoke a third party responsibility mm -hmm. to help take care of some of the town nuisance issues aesthetically that we can. Yeah. Um, um, so so it, it is very well uh, positioned here because 99% um, of the polls in town are in fact Verizon's responsibility as the last one on the poll to remove. Correct. So they actually carry a lot of weight. Right. Before we get into those guidelines, I had a question building on what Bill was saying, asking. And it's really for Jennifer and Nick, and, and that is, is it really, really true that we are limited to aesthetic and that we cannot exercise what we always do with our local zoning, et cetera, in terms of public health and welfare? I mean, how can that be? And can, what, can we not still impose that in our, in our guidelines um, unless the federal uh, law actually uh, specifically prescribes that we cannot do that? I, so, like, to me, it's just mm -hmm. mind-boggling. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here saying, what about sight lines? We can't put that as aesthetics? It's not aesthetics, it's safety. I mean, it's public well, welfare so, and safety. So the Federal Telecommunications Act, which we're familiar with from the app being applied to large cell towers, um, also applies to these small cell facilities. And it's in that respect which the municipalities are preempted from looking at the um, safety aspects. When we talk about the safety aspects of the health impacts, we're not talking about sightline distances. Sightline distances are still within your pur purview because that would be a safety impact and somewhat related to aesthetics, but certainly safety. When we talk about safety and health, we mean you can't say that an antenna facility is too close to a house or right. a playground or something of that nature. The federal government has said that's not within the local jurisdictions purview to examine and say you don't want a, an antenna near a particular store or particular house because the FCC has guidelines, they've done a lot of the emissions testing, and they say as long as the applicant says they do not exceed that threshold, then the municipality can't inquire. But to your point about double poles, about safety impacts from sight lines, being set back from a certain area, as long as you can justify it in those traditional police powers, then the board has the ability to do so. Well, my, my take on would be this, uh, let me just finish and then for, uh, let Jennifer speak, is my impression overall of the law is that the, from my perspective, is that the tone of the law should be strengthened and not just this <coughs> mealy mouth aesthetics where we really want to, uh, you know, get a tone in there about public safety. So it's, I don't think it's sufficient from my standpoint to, to ask them to remove a double pull because it's aesthetics. I think there should be something in here that really strengthens where we're coming from as a community and say, yeah, it's aesthetics, but also this we, we think this is a police issue, this is a safety issue, and to the extent that we're creative and, 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 wheel, and, and, and weave that into the law, I personally would prefer it, because to me, uh, and we've, we've had conversations on the planning board about this, we understand that the federal guidelines, we have, to, we have to abide by those, but to the extent that we can find cracks in there, where we have a bona fide uh, need or right to really look at this a little bit more closely and to give some teeth to it, I think we should do it. And, I, and my overall impression, which was a very brief impression, mm -hmm. having just gotten this uh, re recently, is that the tone of the law is, is very soft. Now, I may be confusing it with the guidelines, which are extremely soft, because it basically said, how would you like to do this? <coughs> it's like, well, we don't have to. But um, the law itself, it seems to me, my perspective is that the tone needs to be tightened up and needs to be strengthened. Well, I don't disagree with you that when it comes to health and safety, we need to make sure that we um, strengthen it where needed. But at the same time, I feel that we need to make not make it overly restrictive because I think that ultimately we do want to encourage this technology within our town because we do ultimately want to be able to have 5G wireless within our within our town borders. So I think we have to strike the right balance between you know, making sure we're ensuring the health and safety concerns that you've raised, but at the same time not being overly restrictive and precluding ourselves from being among the first communities selected for this. I, I, I suggest that I don't think it matters how restrictive we believe our language is in the guidelines or our legislation. This technology is coming, and the FCC is not going to is not going to mm -hmm. is not going to support sure. us in that. So I wouldn't be concerned about suppliers coming in and saying, well, gee, you know, Newcastle, they're kind of, you know, tough, so we're not going to provide the technology. They're going to come. And I, th I, I agree with Bob that 
and I don't know, I don't think you can get into the technology aspects of it, no. right? But I do think that to the extent that, <coughs> yes, aesthetics is all we have to deal with, we maybe ought to be sure that we're interpreting that in a way which really does protect the community and is very strong language. I will, I will comment on one aspect, Tom, is that from our experience in representing a number, a number of municipalities, we've also, our firm has been in the forefront of this, and we've spoken with um, other legal attorneys throughout uh, New York State, Syracuse and Plattsburgh and other municipalities. We've spoken with New York State Conference of Mayors, and we've spoken with counsel for the telecommunication facility, uh, companies, and it's our understanding that they are looking at communities and those who put up barriers they're either litigating or they are moving on to other communities who are more receptive to this technology. And they're also looking to work with communities to come up with the right type of legislation that addresses and tries to strike that balance that you mentioned. So the industry is looking at the different types of legislation that's out there. And we've seen in some communities where they had applications, they pulled those applications uh, away from those communities. But they're coming back. No, not... No, not, not. not anytime soon, but they're coming back. Well, uh, when and we're done so with all the other communities, then they'll come back. And they'll, yeah, they'll come back. And, and, they'll so hope, and they're looking for a community in which they can litigate against also to find that perfect test case. Well, that's fine. But, well, but I guess I'm saying that. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, understand that. And I understand that. I guess I'm saying I don't know to what advantage it is to the community to say, oh, let us be the first. I don't understand well, we, that we're not mentality. We're not the first. I think we want to be among the first. I think when people get off of the train to look at our community and want to buy a home in our community and seeing that we're connected to 5G wireless, I think that's a, I think that that's a potential selling point. I also think it'd be interesting, we had this conversation earlier about the idea of potentially pursuing municipal wireless at the same time that we're pursuing this. Um, I think this might op open up a lot of opportunities for us. And, and I'm not disagreeing that the legislation should be tightened. All I'm saying is I think we need to be careful not to make ourselves overly restricted. I mean, one of the questions that I have is whether <coughs> the um, language in here that pertains to the performance bond, um, if that's something that's standard or, or, you know, how that, that's new to us, right? So that came in through the planning board review, and I'm just interested to hear how that sort of came in and, and whether we think that that's something that would, you know, potentially turn off these providers. Sure. So the Performance bond issue is something that um, we've seen more communities don't have it than do have it. There are certainly communities that do, um, but it's, it's, I would not say it's typical that you would have that requirement. For example, I don't know that you necessarily have it with um, all the utilities that are out there, and that's one of the things the FCC is looking at. How is wireless facilities being treated compared to other utilities? Is, for example, when Con Edison puts up a transformer on a pole, are they being required to put up a performance bond? Is Cablevision being required to put up a performance bond? One of the, the FCC ruling in the summer, in August, was very strict, and the intent is to assist the, uh, the uh, telecommunication companies in rolling out 5G. That's one of the goals of the, of the FCC. So we're looking to make sure that utilities are being treated uh, equally. And so the performance bond one uh, is one that is, is not standard or typical. I have a couple of questions following up on both the aesthetics of the poll and then on treating utilities the same. Okay. First on the aesthetics of the poll, I think it's great that the guidelines address getting rid of the double poles. We've all seen yellow yellow cord around poles all over town and I think we, you know, we'd like to see those go. Um, uh, but those are the poles that have sort of already broken and then they put another pole and lashed the two together. But you also have the poles that are, you know, tottering over under the weight of all the wires that they're currently carrying. And then, you know, you're talking about adding more um, apparatus to it. And we don't, I don't really know how much that apparatus weighs or, you know, how much where it's positioned is going to affect the leverage of the pole going over and everything. So is there anything that we can do to address replacing not just the double poles, but the poles that look like they're in danger of coming over, you know? There, there are, and I believe it's in your law, and I would defer to counsel for the exact location, but there are requirements that the poles for mounting the 5G are structurally sound. Um, you, you know, while there are size limitations that are equivalent of a, of a large cardboard box or a small refrigerator, there's weight associated with that, there are technical specifications associated with that, and there's weight-bearing analyses that must be conducted to make sure that the pole can withstand the weight 
and in that vein that it's not teetering over or unstable because then that gets into the public health and safety. 5G is intended to be in more populous areas where at least we, the, the research that's out there, the implementation that we're seeing is in more densely developed areas where there's more um, impact to buildings. If you look at the guidelines, we specifically identified if you're looking at two, a house and a house, where that pool should be. It shouldn't be in the middle of the house, it should be between the buildings, you know, things of that nature, because they are, it, they are more apt to locate 5G in areas where there's more dense development because of the existing network that already exists through the telephone poles, through the light fixtures, to allow it to integrate easily. So your point on structural stability is, is most definitively within the regulations, very similar to what we look at when we look at a large tower to make sure we're not creating a hazardous situation. Okay, so that also brings up another question that I had about both the guidelines and the draft law, which is that sometimes it wasn't quite clear to me that um, it referred to both new poles that were being installed just for 5G as well as old mm -hmm. poles mm -hmm. that were going to be retrofitted for 5G. And I wondered if they were both going to be subjected to the same standards of testing. Yes. Okay, so yes. if that, that's... Yeah, if it's not clear in there for old and new, then, then we need to make it more refined to be old and new. Is, is it possible to put a height, uh, a minimum height of the pole in there? The, the reason why I'm thinking is that it truly raises a very interesting point about the age of the pole and the, for the most part, the leaning poles you're going to find are the older poles that have been up there and, you know, just sort of filling over. Um, the new poles that have been put in, Bob, the new poles that we put in town um, are significantly taller than the older yeah. poles. About 15 feet, I believe. 15 feet <laughs> higher, so I, I think, 45 so feet. they're 45 feet versus, is, is there a way that we could restrict them to the newer 45 foot poles so at least we know that number one those poles are significantly um, larger in diameter than the old poles so there's they are more structurally sound they've been more recently put in so you know there's a little bit more heft to them and there's also a little bit more room to be able to put the stuff on without feeling like you know the, the, just the sheer volume of Apparatus that I think, carried on. You can, I think you can make a requirement, but you also want to balance again the aesthetic impacts. Right. So I don't know that you want to have it as a black letter rule because, in a particular location, a 45 foot pole there may might not be, be appropriate. A, I think Jill has a good point, which is the preferences, and if it's going to be put on a short pole, then it needs to be reviewed for a more, more, more co comprehensive structural review. Because I would say, depending on where you are in town, 15% of the poles are listing at more than 15%. Right. The other thing that you need to I keep aware of is that you don't want to have basically a, uh, an effective prohibition. Right. So if the if the carriers come in and they say, well, that's great, your preference is to be located on these new or higher poles, but in order for us to provide our service, we need to be located on these smaller, older poles. As long as those smaller, older poles are structurally sound and safe, um, you know, I don't think we can require them to be on the newer poles if it's going to prohibit. Yeah, I think the newer but what, what, but what we've actually... Also, I don't know if it works for Millwood, right? Does Millwood have the, the newer poles? I think Millwood poles has the newer poles. Does it? Okay. West End has the newer poles. What we've actually seen in some communities is that Verizon landline will replace a pole with a taller pole in the anticipation that within the next couple of months <laughs> a uh, cell application will, will come onto that pole. And that's what we've seen. In January, a uh, new poll goes in, and then three months later, an application well, comes that's in. That's a good thing. <laughs> so, Again, yes and no. It depends upon the location. Yeah. Um, to kind of that same point, so we have a section here on, on mounting location. And it first number? says, I'm just on page seven, right. it's in the aesthetic guidelines, that oh. um, I, I was not. Clear. Well, it says it should be the top of the structure, which is good, but then aligned with the center line of the structure. So I would kind of hate to see, especially in this downtown where we just put new poles and we're trying to have everything higher for sight lines, to have these giant boxes kind of right in the middle of the poles. Can we mandate that they be mounted higher? What well, we on um, poles that are town poles or Con Edison poles? Well, they're all Verizon. They're all Verizon poles. Okay. Yeah, they're all. 
But isn't it a sort of a pecking order of what's where on the pole? There has to be a standard the placement. Wire, they won't, I don't know that's for example, something. they won't place it on a pole which has a transformer. No, I'm talking right, about the pecking order, which is... It's no, there funny. is. Like, Con Ed is all the way on the top, and then the utilities are lower, but they're still, I mean, they're too low here, I think, but they still, instead of having in the mid-center of the pole, these big boxes, I feel like they should be higher up, just for aesthetic purposes. But to, to the Nobody point Holland makes, look at them. they can, but the electric code has certain separation requirements from when you can have these facilities below the wires mm -hmm. and certain spaces also reserved for other wires. So I think keeping that in mind, yes, you can, when it comes to an application, you can try to push it as high as possible, mm -hmm. but there may be limitations on Where how high Where do they field. fall within the pecking order that in there. the utilities? Where do uh, the, the cell, small, the small cells? Yeah. I honestly don't know. So there is, there's a provision yeah. governing height of the, the infrastructure itself on a pole, and it's in, well, these aren't numbered, but it's section, well, small item 11 within the small cell section. <laughs> I follow. And it does say, it says a small wireless facility shall be no higher than the minimum height necessary. So really, this is, this is trying to keep them from being high. Who would determine the minimum height? I know, but, but I, yeah, I don't know what it is. Because yeah. there's no there's, 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 and there's too much subjectivity here where the applicant's yeah. going to come back and say, Oh, well, we determined the minimum height is this. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we say, how did you determine that? Oh, that's proprietary. We can't share that information. Oh, no, it's as high as the ladder can reach. Yeah, that, have to get a that's, truck. So that's where it's so, kind of it, squishy and it in says, here. And it says minimum required, but it doesn't give a maximum. Yeah. And right. so, you know, if, and so, but the, it looks like the monopoles, or what we call wireless facilities yeah. now, they have a maximum of 150 feet, mm -hmm. but there's no maximum on the small cell. So when does a sm when does a small cell cease to be a non-small cell? And you know if they can be up on a pole as high as 150 feet too. I mean there's no limit on how high that small yeah. cell. And we've had conversations in the planning board. Bob has filled this in a number of times. He's a cynic, so he has said that no matter what Con Edison's, you'll say, well, that pole's structurally sound, and we're not going to be able to say anything unless we have something in the law that says you've got to take into account the weight bearing, the wind uh, projection that you you are introducing, as well as the aesthetics. That's why I'm saying. That's why I'm saying that you know it's 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 important to have those things in there besides you know just the aesthetics. It's my understanding, and I'm I'm a little fuzzy on the technology part of this. Mm -hmm. um, Drew is a lot more well versed at this than I am, but my understanding is that the the um, technology is such that they actually want to keep these facilities lower to the ground as opposed to your typical cell yeah. tower thing where they want to get the highest point. They want to remain closer to where the actual users are. And so right, that's, they're really hideous, like yeah. they're, and they're big. Well, that's, and so and that's we just spent all this money, for instance, like trying to make our downtown Chappaqua look nicer, and now you're going to put these big giant boxes as low as possible on a pole. And that's what Sabrina was yes. trying to address with the aesthetic guidelines, to try to get these to, to not look like a big giant box on a pole. Correct. To have it be shrouded, have it look like a light pole, have it look like... Um, so that you would never even know that that is a, a wireless. So right. But I would change the language to say the maximum as opposed to the minimum, I think. Or, or have a range. We'll, we'll take a look at that. As short as possible, but no higher than. And Bob, to your point about the, the, the heights and everything, it is addressed on page 15 in section 9 where it talks about general and specific requirements for small wireless facility. It talks about making sure that you establish that you meet the certain codes, and there's one specifically for a wind. I'd like to return to Greg's point, uh, which I think actually applies to, I, I made a list of, after having gone through this the other day, the um, aesthetic uh, community character things that are apparently the ones that we're saying we may have the most control over. Yeah. And uh, it may not be complete, but it's camouflaging, location, screening, size, illumination, and within, I guess, a certain restrictions, alternative locations. Now, every, it seems to me, every single one of those items really depend on the technology that's available and our understanding of that technology. Because Greg's right, these guys come in and they just say, I'm sorry, that's the way it is. And we're having a conversation now about you know where it goes on the pole and how big it is. I think that that information, that, that those restrictions ought to be in here but I think that we need to be sure we're in a position to really understand what we're talking about as we finish writing this. 
and as we go ahead and pursue it as part of our town code. And I'd like to ask, has this been vetted by any consultant? Yes. Okay. Yeah, part, part of the development of this uh, between Drew and I is we did go to a wireless technical specialist and they, you know, again, the diagrams, the pictures, you know, they looked at this. And the technology is such that it's still very experimental in the sense of how to incorporate it from an aesthetic standpoint to where it's acceptable in your community. And whether it has to be high up on the pole or down low they're, on the they're, pole? They're particularly... They're we down, don't know that yet. Well, we don't know for certain, but the guidelines of the technology require it to be lower than a standard pole, uh, a monopole. That's the, the technology... How high is the standard monopole? We're looking at 150 feet. Oh, you mean one of the towers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Right, and, and so, so they're localized, but is, is it localized to putting it into a peak of a roof line on a, on a 35 foot high roof line? Or 10 feet or, up on a pole. Uh, correct, right. correct. And there's not enough information or experience with this in communities such as ours that we have good benchmarks. Do we have a sense of what the actual coverage is? I mean, it's very localized. How local is it? I have an article from the New York Times. 500 feet, 1,000 feet. 500 feet. I have an article from the New York Times from March that says yeah, it's, it says uh, placed an average of 500 feet apart. Average. So it's eight per mile. Average. Average, right? Average. You could have. It's be much closer. Today. It's like three It probably depends on what's in between you and the next pole. Oh, right. You know, the, the topography, the bedrock, the yeah. the yeah. topography, the bedrock, the. And they go in limited areas. It's only in, quote, hot spots, so it's not going to be everywhere. It's down at the train station. It's where is the intense use. I suggest that that's not true. Yeah. I suggest that once, this tech, once these phones come out, mm -hmm. everybody's going to want one yeah. because that's the, that's the nature of our culture. Everybody's going to want one. This, and what so. they're going to want to do is, even if they don't use it to you're, talk to their refrigerator, they're going to want but one. Your phone, will, your phone <laughs> yeah. will connect automatically to 5G when 5G is available. will connect to right. 4G when 4G is available. Yeah, but, if, but everyone's going to want 5G. If they're, 5G if they're buying 5G, they're they're gonna gonna want 5G, 5G, 5G to cheat yeah. on all their internet. Right. Sure. But, you know, the model yeah. that they have so far is to put them in downtown areas. So we've primarily been looking at them. Downtown John Wyatt and would possibly have towards John Crossing. But if we're going to write legislation, and, and God, I think we have to anticipate that they're end up in the neighborhoods. I, there's a, there, Sabrina, I think I read somewhere that there was, in terms of preference for location, the, the neighborhoods was one of the ones that was discouraged. Mm -hmm. And is it really, can you yeah, really it's, say uh, that? It's no, number yeah. 19 on the location guidelines. Well, it, this is a least preferable location. This is a guideline. These are guidelines only. And, and the intention is to put them in the more densely developed areas, the commercial districts, is not to put them in their resident, residential areas. Well, that would be areas. their intention. Right. Because that's what It seems I like think. eventually they'll want to put them into the residential yeah, areas. Yeah, of course. And so these are the guidelines. Way. If you guys don't want the guidelines the way they're written, I mean that's why they're drafted before you. But you know, but they would overcome that because it's a, it's a hierarchy of preference. So if their need is to put it in a residential area, and our zoning code says put it in a commercial area, but there's no commercial district in that area, then they would have satisfied the test by showing that they could only put it in the residential area to meet that particular need. Yeah, but the particular need are the residences. Otherwise, we wouldn't put them in the residential area, right? So well. Depends what the need is. I mean, the need may well be to put a commercial area, but if they have the need in the residential area, this code doesn't prohibit it from going into those residential areas. Yeah. So I don't. Okay. I just don't understand why it's even in there then, because once they demonstrate the need, they'll do. They wouldn't put it in a residential area if there was no need. I mean, why would they do that? They'd put them in the commercial area where, apparently, that's where the the density of of use uh, exists. So I just. It seems to me that it's doesn't make sense to have that provision in here. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a little, I mean, I do, I don't want to discourage the technology. And I, I would love to see all downtown wireless. That's a different issue. But uh, I think, you know, when you, when you consider the fact that we just, we're redoing the downtown, and now we're going in, we're becoming guinea pigs for this thing. We don't know really what it's going to look like. We don't know where they're going to mount it. There's a lot of unknowns, and I think we're taking a big risk with our brand new downtown to basically say, hey, utility companies, which are like the last person you want to trust with anything, you know, do your thing, 
But I would the point, test case. I mean, but I would point out if you don't have these regulations, it's they're, they're, they're coming. They're, they're going to come sword. in, and under the FCC rules, you put up in the moratorium. You can't slow them down. There's a shot clock. So you want to adopt these rules sooner rather than later. Right. Well, I'm not we saying to, to I'm not saying scare right. them. I'm not saying yes. we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying we should. I think we should be a little tough with these regulations because we don't want to leave this to their discretion. And if that scares them away. So be it. They're going to come back eventually, but maybe there's going to be some litigation. Maybe they're going to learn. We're going to learn some stuff. At least then we won't be the guinea pigs. Yeah. Like we'll know more about it. And, and the technology yeah. will be smaller yeah. and nicer right, exactly. looking exactly. in the two or three right. or five years. Yeah. Yeah. The 6G right. will be out in <laughs> three <laughs> or four years. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Are, and then there'll be and a whole other. Yeah. And then they will remove the equipment from the 5Gs. Yeah. 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 They'll still be there. Exactly. Right. One of the things I learned in uh, in platoon reconnaissance <laughs> is that you chose the point man and you didn't let him stay out there forever because eventually he would die. And and so, you know, to you, uh, you said that, well, maybe you don't want to be first. I agree with that. And you agree with that, at least in concept. I don't want to be first. But maybe there's a way when we do the words here and everything that we can, we can have it uh, tight to begin with and see what happens and then make adjustments as we learn from others in Plattsburgh or wherever that uh, how it, how's it going with them and what are they coming up with? I mean, because I'm looking in here that's saying 20 foot poles or less, that's what they want to do and, uh, and they need to be 10% above rooftops, I guess, and other things. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff here that would be interesting to see more about yeah, and then agree. quickly change things. I just think it's a lot of risk we're taking. But okay, but in terms of the timeline, right? We had until April fifteenth, right. which has come and gone, no, to be able a, yes. to adopt our guidelines. So I mean, I think we do have to move quickly mm -hmm. towards, or we lose the opportunity to provide well, you, the you guidelines. Can move quickly, period. but I think we, we can, should just also right. we should not not be incredibly tough, but I think we should write, you know, draft the legislation of the guidelines that we feel right. comfortable with. Like and if they're acceptable, great. Side. If it's not, well, well, maybe it was for the Do best. Do you have specific language that you would like to take and modify? No, no, I, but I think everybody's bringing up some good points, and I think we should try to incorporate them as opposed to being scared that we're going to scare them away. Because scaring them away may, I'm not saying we want that, but it, it could be a good thing in retrospect. We don't know. That's the point. We're taking a big risk. I think we should try to minimize our risk here. But I think well, there's enough right. language in the FCC rules and enough um, la language that can be put in the code that allows you to regulate the aesthetics. So if you want something stealth in the downtown area because you've spent a lot of money in improving your infrastructure and improving the look of it and you're concerned, that's justifiable, right? If you're doing it on a uh, isolated section of a road, there's a little difference there that the courts would recognize. But if you're downtown areas, you've got buildings, you've put all this money in, that you can justify, and there is very good stealthing technology that's, that's where they put it on light poles, they put it on traffic lights, so it can be done, and you have the ability to have your regulations, to have that strength in there to support it. So, I mean, to that point, someone's asked for about specific language, I think in 20, on one of my drafts here, page 6 of 7, uh, with a recent line out, consideration of alternate locations, the town reserves the right to propose an alternate location for a small wireless facility or wireless support structure at, at the one, uh, to the one proposed in the application. And of course, then the operator shall use it if it has a type of error, if it has the right to use the alternate location or reasonable terms on reasonable terms and conditions, and the alternate location does not impose technical limits. The problem is that any kind of proposal that we make, we're going to hear back that there are technical, technical limits. This is our experience. This is what happens. So my, my take on this is that that language to what I've heard from Rob and Greg and, and, and others is to the extent we can do it and not get in trouble, can that language be uh, strengthened? So it's not that we propose it, we, you know, this is kind of, this is a requirement. And, and I'm gonna Without say, using the word requirement, because I think that's probably not good. And, and I'm going to say to you what I was told by this entire section by council, who is not here tonight, is that the location guidelines are dictated in the FCC regulation that this is our best attempt to tell them we'd rather it be in a different location, please try and work with us. That, and you can see these strikeouts here because it was much more specific. Yep. It related to the right of way, it related to the sidewalk. We took it out because it was conflicting with 
FCC guidelines. But perhaps to the point that we just heard from Nick, that we would uh, maybe make it a little bit more specific for certain areas. If we're talking about the, the hamlets, and perhaps in the Chapel Hamlet, we say, because we just did X, Y, Z, we really don't want it. And, you know, it's not just a proposal. We really don't want it there. And anticipate that if you come in here and, and propose that, you know, we're going to have a hard time with it. So I think also these guidelines are designed to let people know how to do this and how to best get through the process and do it without uh, annoying people who are going to be customers. So uh, I, mean, I think it goes both ways. And this is a business deal. So, I mean, there's marketing involved in here as well. So, I mean, why come in here, put stuff up that's all tacky, and then say, well, we want, also you, you know, we want you to pay for this and, and use it? I mean, obviously some people do, but, you know, we'll do that. And does the, do the FCC guidelines give them authority to just put new poles in? <laughs> no, we, you can regulate that for your street opening permits. Right, so these are either going to go on... Um, existing poles. Existing poles, or on private property. And if it's an existing pole, then it's in the right of way, and they would be putting it for putting a new poll in to answer your question. They need a street opening permit. Do they need permission Just for the private property owner? Yes. 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 And, the, and the private property owner would be paid something. I said. Correct. Yes. And can a private property owner say no? No, no absolutely. Yes. And can a municipality say no and say we're not giving you a street opening permit to no. make any poll? No, we don't. No, no, we don't. No. They no. Well, they're, they're, you, well, they're utility the companies. They, they don't. I mean, we, we right. have been toying with the idea of requiring it for um, Con Ed insofar as gas mains in the street because well, we've had issues. Yeah, yeah, because we've had issues with the quality of the repairs just <coughs> drive down North Greeley Avenue. Well, maybe we want to look at that and create a process. Right for street opening permits. Well, if they're opening up your. Well, well, that's if they're being ones when they come in and decide to rip up the sidewalks that we just right, did right. in town because they want to put in a different kind of pole. Right. Yeah. The well, answer should just be no. If there's an existing pole they could put something on, the answer should be no, you can't put in a new pole. Right. Would they need a we permit? Have that authority to do but that? doesn't this actually say somewhere in there that we want them to locate underground as much as possible? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So that, con that contradicts that. Well, wait a minute. There are two points to the equipment. The, 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 the antenna part, the, the receptor the part is on the top, but then the equipment part right. of it could be underground. So there, yes. the, you know, you're going to have Maybe. Where the fuck are they going to be? So where are they going to be? How would they do that downtown? They have to rip it up. Yeah. They have to rip up the sidewalks again? They'd have to put funny. it back. They, they rip it up, they have to put it back. <laughs> and, and, and typically they will not be putting them underground because they yeah. it's too expensive for them to put it back. To answer your question, Jeremy, you, you can, it, at the end of the day, they can place it within a, uh, if they get consent from the property owner or the owner of a pole, and they demonstrate the need, you can't tell them no. They can find somewhere to place it within reason. Unless you can demonstrate that it's a static or safety concern. What about erecting their own pole? What about what? Uh, erecting their own pole. If they get permission from the landowner, they can do so. No, yeah. and what about the town? town property? The town. Well, the town right away. Like, can we say no if there are existing poles? No, no, just, no, no Tom's question, question is if they put a, can, can they? they put a new pole in the town right away, which is... Yes. Or no. Well. So, look, I'm hesitating because at the end of the day, the only way they can meet that need is by putting a new pole in. They can put a new pole in. There you go. So that gets back to the So, says no. Right. They're stuck. They need to put it on a pole that doesn't exist because it's too far away. Yep. They could then stick a pole in our new concrete sidewalk. And, right. And then when and we break. go, no, you can't do that, they're going to say, oh, we need to put it exactly right here. And we here have to put here it are the propagation chambers. Well, they could they couldn't interfere with, so, for example, yeah. ADA compliance. Yeah. No, no, no. But that's, so why, that's why it's a potential, because yeah. if there are ways where you can deny it because of <laughs> sight line distance, both vehicular and pedestrian, ADA access, right. truck so delivery access right, 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 to get right, to right. a. So we can, okay. Right. By the way, when, if it's a town property, then we get street, we don't even own. Yes. County, right? State. Are you reading my notes? So, uh, state comes from the town. That's a good oh, question. Well, except the is a good question. Uh, oh. or at least starting when it's rent. Nick, what about what about Robert's mentioning about um, state and county roads? If it's even though it's in our municipality, if it's a state road or a county road, where do we fall in the pecking order of saying no? 
or you have to do something. If it's, if, it's a, if it's a state or a county road, then we don't have that authority because then it's... Well, that's a problem for Newcastle. Yeah, right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, even that's a real problem for Newcastle. Yep. Yeah, that's what we're doing here. Well, we basically this is the lower king. Yeah, what do we do? Yeah. 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 Okay, we decide what do we, what do, we do in that, in that situation yeah, because we accept it as our own, we maintain it as our own, but it's not ours. So then how do we regulate that? We don't. We're going to approach the county that. Well, but if it's within the... You tell me it's in the state or county right of way. Yeah, if it's a small, small state. wireless application permit, a mm. small wireless permit, then it gets regulated through this this draft local law, which may potentially become your local law. Even so though it's even small, though it would be on a state right of way. Even though even they, they yeah, still need the land use yeah, approval. Still need the, the permit. Okay. So they so still need the permit, permit from the planning board. So they could still cite one. We don't have the ability because it's yeah. not town road to say no. Right, but through going through that the land use process, process, the land yeah. use process, that's where we talk about all these aesthetic guidelines and encourage them to shield it and to do camouflage better. it and do better. So just as a this is a bit of a digression, but I think it's important. If you could it seems to me what we're doing here is we are aesthetically anyway, we're trying to control where this particular utility puts its stuff, right? And yeah. how they do it in right. terms of right community character. Yes. We have Con Ed, we have Verizon, we have T-Mobile, we have all these other providers, and they don't have to do any of this stuff that we are now requiring or want to require this new provider to come and do. There's a way to go back and to, to write in, in legislation guidelines for the other service providers, the cable providers. Con Ed puts on the pole of Verizon, wherever they put boxes wherever they want to put them, uh, Verizon or T-Mobile or these, they, they will they will hang giant pieces of equipment from a pole. They'll lay it on the ground, and apparently we we have the authority to do something about that, and we are policing it, or we don't have the authority to do something. About it, it, it's interesting because I'm not a uh, utility expert, but or trying to be once here. Yes. <laughs> Some are probably franchise agreements, right? Uh, cable, Con Ed, electricity. Those are all franchise agreements, and they're regulated by the Public Service Commission. And that's different from the cell phones, which are regulated by the FCC. So there are a different set of rules and regulations that govern each of those utilities. And how it interplays with the ability for a municipality to regulate, I'm just not as familiar with. But we are asserting the ability to do it here. Because we've, we've been given the opportunity. Right. Under the FCC rules, we have the ability to regulate the aesthetics aspects of it. That's it. We don't but have we, that ability, to my knowledge, with respect to... Has it been specifically denied? Wireless. Denied, you know denied, even with respect to the other yeah. utilities? Right. I, I don't know one way or the other. Let's see if I know. Yeah. Well, well I have to tell you, there. Yes. Just, yes. just as an interesting aside, when <clears throat> we try to find utilities for double poles being up in our town within six months after an emergency, the Public Service Commission paid us a visit and told us that, that we were well beyond mm -hmm. our authority. <laughs> we got their attention. The, uh, Con Ed is the one who contacted them to let the public service know that we were uh, usurping their authority. Okay, so why don't they make them do it? They, <laughs> they, they, well, they, they do they through been. engines, and it's a voluntary compliance. And like doing I said, it. spotty fish. Slowly, but slowly. they've been doing it. Yeah, they've been doing it already. Oh, yeah. So just while we're on the cover, we had uh, 52 remaining. Uh, part part of me, I apologize. Out of uh, we have 64 remaining on the state road, double poles, four on county roads, 78 on uh, town roads. Um, in total, we've got 130, we've got 135 double poles on town roads, five on county roads, and 52 on state roads, for a total of about 56 and a half percent to seven percent. I did warn you this would be a digression. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, if you look at the double poles, most of the double poles are half poles, which all the utilities are off, with the exception of Verizon. And that was our experience at Chapman Crossing, too. It took Verizon forever to come, remove their wires, and then apparently the, the rule is that the last one off the pole removes the pole. So the truth is, it seems like Verizon is uh, yes. the real problem on these things. I'll tell you, look around at some of these double poles, and you'll see they're all half. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the direction from the collective boards is to go back, look at these codes and guidelines, and make the guidelines more requirements than guidelines. Make the code. Um, 
more precise, so there's less wiggle room and more, uh, it's more finite and more specific. And I think those, are, those are what you want us to go back and do. We'll have to clarify some of these things street opening permits. I would assume that, as always, if we have specific concerns and things we'd like comments. to change, we should send those comments uh, to you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, copy Sabrina, but I think it's really important that specific um, items be noted so that we capture what it is that the board wants exactly. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank I think you. one of the issues out there is the, in, in regard to the aesthetics is that when you're doing a pole that's designed for a 5G installation, there are ways that sort of more attractive with camouflage it, but we need to have the do's and don'ts examples of the utility poles where presumably a lot of the initial um, ins installations will be on existing poles rather than specially designed poles. So I've seen a lot of ugly pictures of uh, existing utility pumps retrofitted with 5G technology. We have, looked at, have we looked at other design standards by other towns that have so, uh, adopted them? I made a note of that. So Pasadena, California actually has a very good, and it's a Verizon, um, examples of camouflage that I've done. Whether it's a, a street bench where they put the utilities, the cabinetry, if you will, and the equipment in a bench that, uh, that's on the sidewalk, so it looks more like it's blended in. A mailbox, a faux mailbox, if you will. So I'll circulate that to the two boards. Great. Yeah. Are those things that they've implemented throughout the town or that they've done in one space to say, here, here's where, we should, look how we should so camouflage good it. We should camouflage a bench. I don't care. 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 I there was a compilation. There was, we all have uh, in the city. Really there was uh, something in Missouri. There was the SeaTac that Drew sent around. So is it possible that uh, these places, Pasadena, for mm -hmm. example, because you've raised it, that these uh, municipalities have a better understanding of the actual technology than we have? I mean, do they... Can they say, well, we'll put one in a bench because they know that the that the equipment's going to fit under a bench? Yes, or is but the this, difference... Or are these just sort of ideas? No, 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 no. The difference there is in Pasadena, in my recollection, is there was a collaboration between the municipality and the providers, and that's why they developed those guidelines, because they wanted to become a 5G municipality, if you will. And that was the case in a couple of the communities. Syracuse, for example. Syracuse so there, is the first in New York State right. to have entered into an agreement to make 5G so within just, the... Just to so go so back the, to that... I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, let me just finish my question. So Verizon has an understanding of this technology beyond Pasadena, right? And they, they contributed Absolutely. to the guidelines. So is can we get some kind of feedback from, maybe not Verizon, because apparently they aren't that friendly to us, <laughs> but are there other providers who could who we could tap to better understand the technology and what they anticipate? We can certainly ask those questions. Well, actually, yeah. that's one of my questions, yes, which is that um, we basically, you know, kind of have a structure in place with most of the utilities, like cable or so on and so forth, where they contribute to the town's infrastructure. And the town basically has the option of saying, okay, you can work within our boundaries. It almost feels to me that if we want to have the maximum amount of control, that we would quote unquote award our area to a single provider giving us maximum leverage. Well that we don't have the ability to do so there are how would you do that? Okay. What you would basically say the town would like to enter into an agreement to develop our downtown hamlets for 5G. And we would like to have an R really not like that, yeah. right? Oh, well, my might doing is a sprint. <laughs> Well, I'm just right. saying, but it wouldn't just be them. It would have to. We could have within the town making sure that the 5G was available to anybody who wanted to log on to the system. I just don't see why we. Because I don't want to be a situation no, where, you know, this company is going to be Sprint. This one's going to be that's someone nature. else. This but is that's how it's going to. Yeah, that's nature. That's I know. But why is it that, that you cannot basically have? Because you can't exclude one company over the other. Well, so then Pasadena, if they went into right. this with, did they, how many providers are servicing Pasadena? Uh, not a California utility law expert. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Not even a utility. It just, it just seems California. to me that if you end up having a whole bunch a, of little cheap uh, biting, I, 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 I also, I also want to put out there there are a lot of other entity, uh, other locations that have guidelines. Those guidelines pre-existed the new FCC regulations, so their their guidelines are no longer applicable. And I don't know they have not promulgated new small guidelines cells. for right. small cells that are consistent with the federal regulations. So, you know, that's kind of the catch-22. Pasadena 
that small cell, though, that you were talking about, right? right. Yes. So maybe mm -hmm. we should still look at that. Well, there's contacts over the past Yeah, and I would even say, I would also ask the people who've already it. had it for a couple of years, Perfect. God, what would you like to wish you had done differently? You said me. I'll go look at I'd it I'd be free. happy to take a look at it. Motion to send Tom. That's the end. One way. Right. One way. Only one way. That was Bob who said it. So yeah, so we'll circulate the Pasadena guidelines to both, both boards, and we'll look into the questions that were raised tonight, and we'll have a revised draft around tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> 9 a.m. I love it. I love it. Business with us, come in and make a pitch. And I, but I, I don't think you. I don't think you could do a sole source for utilities. But you might be able to give. If you bid it out, you can have like uh, whoever gives the best yeah, options. Can't. You, can't you can't do, do that. You just can't do that. Why? Because you have no right to restrict. Because the FCC, right? The FCC said everyone has, who has issued what, a license has. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't yeah. have to make sense. It's just federal law. So. And as you if you have specific comments, please send them in to Jonathan. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Carry on. And how appropriate is it? Con Ed and Stormheart. Okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Right there. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're back. Like, oh. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> they, they weren't down there earlier today, that's for sure. Um, hi. You notice some of us are wearing orange shirts. We'll go into that later. Some of us <laughs> forgot. Some of us forgot. There's a home. What's well, okay. up? <laughs> Welcome, Con Ed. So uh, this evening we have Luigi Dingo and Tom Cesarino from Con Ed to come and talk to us about some of the storm parking um, uh, methods that uh, Con Ed is uh, seeking to employ um, in some of our areas in town. Um, and about four or five years ago, we, um, uh, we requested a certain protocol from Con Ed when they were coming in and doing some significant tree trimming, more than just plain tree trimming, to come in and talk to the board about it, to give notification to the neighbors, and to just generally um, communicate uh, with the community as to the extent of the storm hogging methods so that nobody would be surprised. Right. So here they are. Were you guys, Thanks for coming. Did you guys, were you guys uh, involved back then with the West End when uh, they took down a whole bunch of trees? And we had that meeting over at the firehouse and, and uh, No. No, I was not. No, no. no. He's I'm, gone, I think. So <laughs> what was that? It was about, I like Jill said, I think four or five years ago. And, and basically uh, what happens is kind of, you know, they, they did provide notice to the individual property owners that they were going to come in and, and do storm hardening. Right. They didn't really define what that was. And property owners apparently all gave their consent, but what they didn't realize was the scope of it. And then people came home from work that day and essentially it was like a killing field. Oh, trees. that's up by uh, T-Town. Yes. Yeah, exactly. yes. I, I do remember. I, do, I, do remember that. Yes. I wasn't in the group yeah, then, but I do remember that. Yeah. 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 So after that experience, that's why we sort of developed these standards. And and that's been our experience with it, so we're a little bit... Um, How does it? Yeah. If you want, I'll explain to you kind of what we're doing right now. Please. Yeah, so I mean, everybody's familiar with last March. What happened? Uh, the two storms, Riley and Quinn, we, we named them. Um, so we had a. Uh, I didn't have power until I couldn't follow. <laughs> I was actually in Puerto Rico, so I wasn't here at the time. But. Um, You're someone's having an operation. That's and right. It kept he was. getting delayed. Okay. Right. His appendicitis was so it's it's That's right. That's right. And I tried, couldn't get him to answer. Couldn't get yeah. oh. um, But anyway, after that, um, and just so everybody knows, I, I manage all the line clearance, the tree trimming contractors for the company. I also manage all the overhead contractors that we, we have some on the property now. You can want your cell phone before you. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But, um, you know, after those two storms, you know, uh, we actually had a, uh, a vendor come in, Davy Tree Resource, and look at what we saw, what the results we saw, right? And we saw a lot of what we call off right of way trees cause that damage. We do cycle trimming, we trim every three years, every circuit in the company within a three year period gets trimmed, right? It gets trimmed back a certain amount of feet. Um, it's 10, 10, and 15 up here in the county. It's 6, 6, and 10 down in New York City. 
Um, but anyway, that, that gets done routinely. Uh, we usually send out mailers. We let people know when we're doing that. That's been the routine for a long time. But what we saw from, from these two storms was that when you have storms like that, you're going to get damage from trees that you would not normally trim. You're going to get what we call off right away. So not where we would normally trim on people's property, mm -hmm. 20, 30, 50 feet off of the right away. And that's a possibility, especially if they're dead, if they're dying, if they're diseased. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, right, there's a huge problem with ash trees all in the Northeast. There's something called the emerald ash borer that is destroying ash trees. And when I talk about how many trees we remove, 70% of them are ash trees. So it's a big problem. Um, but we, we took that data and we, and we took the information that they gave us and we now have what we call a hazardous tree removal program. A lot of utilities are going to this. They're making it part of the overall program. Um, we're not there yet, but this pilot that we've been doing and we've been running for since last October is basically to get the information that we think is going to tell us that we need to do this all the time. Yeah. Um, so we want I can that just, pilot in our town. Well, I, I will we, tell you what we we're doing. We have written to Con Ed yep. before, and we've requested that the Cortland pilot come to our town. Yeah, and we, well. we, are, we are coming because <laughs> in conjunction with that, we're also doing some overhead storm hardening work. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're matching up some of that storm hardening work mm -hmm. with the removal of these hazardous trees. So we actually do have three locations um, in Newcastle. We only share two. I think there's a two. third that we have to talk about, right. which we didn't. Okay. It's not ready yet. Okay. Um, but there's one on the uh, Mount Kisco Road and Taylor Road. Mm -hmm. That one, one you on gave right uh, Croton Lake Avenue and Seth Canyon Road. Yep, that one you gave us. And then there's another one in the Millwood area. I don't have this one this particulars on that one yet, okay. but we'll, we'll obviously share that with everybody before that. So, so when you're saying that you want to expand to these three areas, are you talking about doing only the right-of-way trees there, or are you talking about the ones that are on private property? These are as well? only the hazardous trees. Only so the we're going to do some. But order. hazardous trees in, in the right-of-way. Off right-of-way. Off right-of-way. Right 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 private property. Off property. So what we're doing is we're doing some overhead storm hardening, which we're actually taking down some of the open wire, which is at the top of the poles, mm -hmm. um, in places where there's not um, connected customers, so to speak. So there's no maybe between 10 spans of poles. It's just wire. There's no transformer that le leads to a house or, or no equipment. And we can actually take that wire and cut it down and we can put much more resilient wire about 25 foot up on a pole. We call aerial cable. And it's much more resilient. It's, uh, it's got a steel <laughs> messenger. It has rings it sits in. Um, oh, you yeah. could have a tree come down and on it. And this is not even that down. allows it to break away, right? So no, it's not a breakaway service. Oh, this okay. is actually cable is about this thick. Yeah. Has all three all three legs are inside of it. Okay. It's held up by a steel messenger. The tree can come and hit it, probably mm. bounce right off. Will not take it down anywhere near as easily as what the open wire does. Really? Yeah. Is that so, the plan to replace all of your wires no, that way? Or no, just we, ones we that can't. Are right, uh, huh. or Here's the problem. We, we can't do that when, when we have to connect to a transformer. That cable does not easily connect to a transformer. So we can only do it where there are no transformers or switches uh -huh. or anything. So we're picking certain spots that we found and we're looking for them and we're saying, okay, from here to here, these 10 spans, which might be a thousand feet, 1200 feet, we're gonna, we're gonna take the open wire down, we're gonna put this other more resilient cable up and in those locations, we're gonna remove the hazardous trees too. So we're gonna make this. And how much higher are you placing the wire? It's lower. placing it lower. Oh, it's lower. It's lower. Feet. Yeah. It's thicker and lower, so the criteria for where the hardening efforts are going? Is it based on outage data? It is. And our engineering group has looked at all of that. They looked at where we have what we call our worst performing <coughs> feeders mm -hmm. in all throughout the county, so it's everywhere. And then we're looking at places where we actually have long runs where there are no transformers. And they've all been identified as a... I would say all. I mean, there's there's these, these are the first ones that we've looked at. Um, and we're, we're doing some in like just about everywhere in the county. <coughs> So what we wanted to do is we want to take these hazardous trees down as well and make that a And do you need permission from the property owner to we do, do that? <coughs> we do. So I'll just give you a little background on the program in general because we're, we're doing, as we did, we did some pilot in Portland, we did a little bit in Yorktown, um, and we've spread so it out. my feelings are hurt. You went to Yorktown second? Well, we went to the two northernmost counties first. <laughs> I wanted to be saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We, we took the data that we got from the report, you know, and said this is, this is the hardest hit areas. All right. So right now, we've surveyed over 1,500. <coughs> so Davey Resources, who did the report for us, is actually working with us. They've um, 
surveyed over 1,500 trees. We've identified over 1,100 that we call are in imminent danger of failing, so probably within the next year. Um, that's a classification that they use in the, in the line clearance, you know, uh, um, that's what they call, yeah, whatever you want to, want to call Sorry it. Sorry to interrupt you. 1,500, no. that's in Newcastle. That's, oh, that's no, that's, no, total so that's far. Total. we'll put it this way, it's total so far. Um, county. It's, it's, we've only been in a few, like a few municipalities. We, we haven't gone anywhere oh. south of, like, Newcastle yet. So between Mount Kisk, <laughs> between Yorktown, <laughs> Cortland, and Newcastle, mm -hmm. in the all three complete municipalities, Davies did a survey and identified 15 We did not survey every tree. We surveyed the worst performing circuits in those areas. It's a very okay. small number. And the radius around those trees. circuses is... Excuse me? That's a frightening number of trees. Yeah, That's not even close. Well, does it, if you only survey the oh, yeah. You're talking about to survey the amount of trees, it's in the hundreds of thousands what? of trees yeah, in yeah, West Chester County. Right. So is there a radius down. around no, that no, no, no. transformer that you... Normally, we, we like I said, um, I don't know if you can see the picture. I can't see the no, picture. No, no, I, I didn't show it to you yet. Do they have incentive to take these trees down? That seems crazy that it's 50, 1,100 out of 1,500. So we, we are saying those are in imminent danger of failing. And what does that mean? Within that the a branch year, could hit it or that the tree could fall? The tree down? is either dead, mm -hmm. diseased, or dying. Mm -hmm. So those are, to, you know, according to arboriculturists, that's in imminent danger of failing. Mm -hmm. So if we can take that tree down, we feel, and I, I, listen, I can't guarantee this, nobody can guarantee it, but it's a good chance that within the next year, mm -hmm. just on its own, mm -hmm. or a small storm, or definitely a large storm. Well, can you, can you give us the distribution of the classification dead, diseased, or dying? Because, you know, this was all field around 1910, 1920 up here. Everything right. was field. And it was at that time that the transition went from basically farming agriculture to a different type of agriculture. And everyone let their fields go. So all of our trees are in the process of like dying. A lot of the mature trees that we all know and love basically are in decline. Right. Because of their age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me the dead trees, that's like a friggin' no brainer. Well, and so, the diseased trees to a certain extent, depending on the extent of the disease, because it's you know, some of it's just starting and some of it is like well on its way. I kind of feel that to in, to support Lisa in that point, I kind of feel depending on where it is, I think you guys really need to give greater clarification around that. And I think for them just to call dead, diseased, or dying and saying, you know, out of the 1,500 trees around this area, 1,100 are in that condition, which is over like a 75% of the total available trees, just seems... So, so yeah, I think the numbers might be confusing. We're not talking 1,500 in Newcastle. We're no. No, no, 1,500 no, no, no. in the I three for the we've page surveyed, everybody at home. Yeah. We've surveyed on particular circuits that we've identified. Right, of course. We've identified... 1500 mm -hmm. that are that are in that condition there's plenty of oh, others oh, that are not but yes right, trees right, that are right. in that area and there are some that um, have no impact on our system right. you know they're a 30 foot tree yeah, that's 50 foot away. away so yeah we're not looking at any of those the other thing we're trying to concentrate on is our what we consider our critical infrastructure so if we have a pole with a transformer on it that feeds mm -hmm. consumers right there yeah that's critical infrastructure if we have a single phase that's feeding one house mm -hmm. down a line, it's <clears throat> less. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm not... No, no, it's totally understand. It's, you know, it's, it's a less of a criti criticality for what we're trying to pick. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go, and then, you know, we had, then we, I forget what the last number I gave you, but it was, you know, 1,130 imminent. We have permission, or we got permission, on over 700 of those to remove. Most people are in, you know, with us on this, they get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, most, most of the ones that we did not get permission is because we couldn't get in contact with people, not because they said no. no. Very rarely are people saying, there's a couple, I'm, I'm going to say maybe less than 10 actually, that people actually said, no, we don't want you to do that. If anybody's, you know, if you've ever taken trees down at your house or had somebody do it, mm -hmm. it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. We're averaging about $1,000 a tree <laughs> yep. to do it. And in Portland, what was it, 98% approval rate? Yeah, I think it was 98%. Yeah. You really? Guys don't, you guys don't replant trees, right? No. Or, or contribute to the fund rate? Nope. Right now we're cutting them down. So, you know, like I said, 
you can you can go outside to a vendor or contract you probably two thousand three thousand dollars a tree for a really big tree yeah <clears throat> so if you you should check out some of the trees on my property i mean they could <laughs> it could impact your, your, your critical infrastructure. Yeah. It's it's um. What what about those locations where there's just branches shooting out in between the, the wires? So it's not. It's, so, exactly, so, for example, on 117, there's a lot of right. it obstructs line of sight, which is a different issue, which may be more of a municipal issue. But you know, if they're already thick branches, if they are within the spec that we have for trimming, they should get trimmed during the cycle trimming once every three years. Now, one of the things we're trying to do is, is to gather a lot of information, right? It's, it's, it's easier to do that now. We have the vendor doing all this work for us. What we want to try to identify is where we have fast-growing trees and where we have fast-growing areas. And maybe our cycle needs to be adjusted in those areas. Maybe there's other areas that the cycle doesn't need to be as quick because we don't have the type of trees. So we have to, I think, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is become more of a vegetation management program rather than a tree trimming program. Mm -hmm. is it, is so it's, it's, it's tough, it's, it's, you gotta get a lot of information, you gotta get a lot of data. Is it, some, is it worth it to you if the town provided you information about trees that also became issues for line of sight and roadways? That may not impact your issue, but at the same time, yeah. if it's coming through your wires, it's still a line of sight problem, so it's it, a marriage it's, of the two issues. In case you want to take it down. No, no, it's a marriage of the two issues, the line of but it may be on year one of your, of your cycle, so why wait for two years? Anything that's a line of sight issue, probably what you're talking about, stuff coming through our wires. Our wires are typically on the top. You're talking about um, the tele telecom wires on the bottom. Yeah, especially if you go 117, you'll see a lot of wires being, um, a lot of trees leaning on the telecom wires. When you're driving by, you say, oh, look, at they're, they're leaning on the electrical lines. They're not. They're not. Okay. Because anything like that would have been trimmed on our three-year cycle. So I'll pass this around. If you want to take a look at it. So this is how we trim, right? So it's it's 10 feet on the bottom, 10 feet on the side, 15 foot on top. No, no, we, um, we actually... Do you have that? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, so you have it. Let me yeah, finish what I was saying. There could be a marriage between our issues and our issues. I didn't stop you before you, you were saying it. You were laughing and chuckling. I didn't stop you. It's very hurtful. If, if, so exciting. So if you have... So exciting. <laughs> if you have issues, and I'll give you a perfect example, right? In most storms, one of the big issues we all have is road road blockage, right? right? Roads that need to be cleared. Yeah. So if you have an area that you think is, is a critical road, if that marries up with our wires being on that road and it's critical infrastructure for us, which a lot of times they are because they're main roads, um, that's to both of our advantages. If you identify things like that and let me know about it, We'll take a look at it. We'll survey it. All, we'll all in the paths to the hospital. So 117, yeah, right. certainly 120, 133. I mean, mm -hmm. we would yeah, certainly. Yeah, we, we looked at some stuff on Underhill Road in Yorktown, and that's yeah. a critical path to get to the train station. That's people travel at all the time. Their emergency vehicles are always traveling. So we're willing to look. Anything you want to provide us, okay. I'm more than happy to go out and take a look at it. And if it matches up with what we can do, um, we, you know, if it needs trimming and it's off cycle, but it's but it's really covered. That's fine. We can do some of that. If there's hazardous trees within that span, you know those those couple of spans or wherever it is, um, we'll make it part of the program. So, question I've got for you is is that so I, I very much appreciate uh, this flyer, but the issue is is that this actually isn't the work that you're doing when you do your storm hardening, because you're taking down the hazardous trees, right. so you're doing significantly more trimming than this. Right. No, actually, we don't do any trimming while we're taking the hazardous okay, trees. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. right. But yeah. but when I asked for like what was the mailing that was going out to the neighborhood to let like neighbors know that you were going to be like you know Mount Kisco, Armonk Road, Mount Kisco, Taylor Road, to let them know that you were going to be in town. Um, that you had the permission from property owners, that you had identified dead, dying, disease trees, and that you were trying to be proactive and you know, keeping everybody's lights on. This isn't going to stop people from calling up and getting all upset that they're coming down, they're trimming, you know, they're taking down trees, they didn't ask anybody, which is oftentimes what happens in these neighborhoods um, where people are very concerned right. about the, you know, you take down, I mean, you're talking about 12 trees, 15 trees. These are big old trees. It's, people sure. are going to notice. So, um, is there some sort of just maybe more more targeted letter that you could send to communities just to let them know or provide to me so yeah. that I can send out mm -hmm. notices? You yeah, know, in my with, administrator's I don't think you report. Really thought about that? I mean, I, I, we I, haven't, I, but if we get that information, I can certainly send it to you, and you can put it out on. 
Right. You yeah, I mean, I, on your website. Or yeah, because I'd want? like to be able to incorporate well, this in, you know, in notifications that we give to the general community that you guys are out, that you're doing this, that you have the permission of property owners, and that you might see a lot well, of the permission of property yeah. owners. Since I was part of the storm hardening Alapartis Road sweep that you guys did in the Teton area, but I was the year after. Okay. You had not done the what the big swap you did on Spring Valley was, and Glendale was one swap. I was the year after. The only thing I got was like this little notice that barely told me any, inf any information with no number to contact. Or if there was, I called and I got nobody so that said we're going to be in your area because I, for one, would probably have not only allowed them to cut trees but pointed out additional trees that you should probably right. take down. And I will tell you that one of the things we've done. So I have to tell you, I was very, I mean, that was a year after the whole thing mm -hmm. and Con Ed came in, nice lady, very very persuasive you know I'll, this will never happen again and then Jane. yeah Jane well I will tell you this we since last March right we've Luigi and I have both been on the same team with our, our, uh, our Orange and Rockland and one of the things we recognize is number one we had all different mailers and different things that went out between oh. the two companies so we've really streamlined that we've got pretty much the same information going out and one of the things that's good is to get hear back from people because I think our assumption was well we're talking to the property owners we're telling them we're going to take the tree well we didn't talk to the neighbor mm -hmm. and we didn't no, talk to right. somebody down the block right. Right. in this case right. when we do trimming we're trying to tell everybody mm -hmm. we're trying right. to come out and yeah. do a mailer we also have what we call contractor foresters they're people that work for the vendor yeah. who actually go to each customer and tell them what we're doing I mean, I but when we when we did danger trees or hazardous trees we were only going directly to the property right. owner so if it if it makes sense to go and, and tell more people about yeah, it, it's in fine. these neighborhoods, it's we're fine. We can no, get the, these are the problem is we can get some the, of these neighborhoods the are like historic neighborhoods right. where the trees actually add to the character of the neighborhood. So if you start taking trees down, even though you have permission maybe from the actual property owner, and one of these neighborhoods is right where I live, I guarantee you. People will be up in arms that that yeah, trees in this historic oh, neighborhood are coming down. I was down. thinking Taylor Road is one of yes, those roads. Right. Yes. I remember four or five years ago going through there with, with the an no, arborist. No way. And it was, Pines, and, yeah, and, and yeah. there were dead tree after dead tree after dead, dead tree, tree, and they yeah. wouldn't let us touch any of them. Yeah, so I, I, I tell you, the position, character of the right. So, right. so if we can get that word out, now, sure. so that you, you know, frankly, so that everybody's aware and they're on notice. I, I think it will soften the impact. So I'm sorry, I, I wasn't, it would I wasn't be better clear. If we got that information to you guys and you put it out, I'm, I'm fine to so do that. So that we don't have customers getting it from us and then attacking yeah, We could put it, we could do yeah, a yeah. car, yeah. uh, code red. Have you guys already gotten yes. the permissions? On yes. two of those, yeah, we have. On, on the, these two there are only permission. two. You said there was a third There's a third. I just don't have the specifics on that one. Yes, they have the permission for 13 now. What about the... We, we should the trunks. The whole neighborhood should know. You're gonna grind them down. For sure. Uh, no, we don't grind the stump. Leave the stump. I leave, leave the stump. stump. Half they half leave stump. about three feet. Three feet? No. Yeah. No, it shouldn't be more than eighteen inches. Yeah, it's usually okay. good. And they probably uh, owners obviously know this. Right. Yeah, when when we when we go and talk to the homeowners we explain exactly right. what we're gonna do. Because when you guys did the West End that time, you left stumps. like six feet. You that, probably came that, back. Well, later. That was part of the problem, right? The problem was that we do that in two parts. We went we cut enough down so that we can follow up with a log truck, attach a log truck to the top of it, and then cut it down and then take it away. Right. When people were coming home, they were looking at that. Ten and they're thinking they right. couldn't exactly. have left this finished right. product, exactly. and we didn't. But and that's why the that, that's that's where we felt short. Yes, that's, a, we that's exactly what it was like. Right, because right. that's as bad, no. like, So I, I will tell you, optics. from when we were doing it back then, we have a completely, I wouldn't say different setup but we have dedicated crews that are just doing this and a log truck is part of the process. Right. Um, I would say also say it depends on the vendor because I definitely saw back where, where I live in the West End um, that you know they were cutting trees instead of picking up and actually taking the trunks away they were sawing them into like five foot things and then hucking them down the slope. They shouldn't be doing that. I thought so. So if anybody does that let me know. Yeah, so I'll take smaller. care of it. With the That's vendor. why I'm getting the number. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like oh, yeah, it really was not a well-managed, well-run operation on any level. And it is, yeah. much, like Tommy said, it's much different today um, because the hazard tree program has incorporated a log truck and the cutting truck, and they go out together. Yeah, and, we, and we've, we've learned, I'm going to be honest, we, we've, we've seen some of the mistakes that have been made and, and what we need to do to change that. And I think we're, at least what I'm trying to do is, is make this part of the program. It, you know, when it's a one-off and you do it one time, 
I think it's just, okay, just get it done, finish that project, and we'll get back to what we really do. This is part of what we should be doing. If you check around, um, I know Connecticut, they just signed, I don't know how many millions of dollars to do a, a different kind of program where it's trimming and hazardous tree removal and herbicide, and they're looking at it as a vegetation management program. They're not looking at it as a tree trimming, and I think we're, we're moving in the same direction. So, and we, listen, I've been to a couple of meetings where, where people have asked us, can I leave a 15 or an 18 foot trunk of a tree? Right, for, for wildlife, snag, for yeah, snag. what a snag, right? So I mean, it's it's all a little new to us, I think, you know, and we're trying to, to incorporate that. And so if we're hearing that you want to know, it's so we can let neighbors know, that's fine. It's good exactly. information for us, and we'll take that back and make it part of the program. Yes, yes, you just forward it to my director, uh, my attention. Also, um, my uh, my DPW was just interested in the in the um, the location, the addresses of the trees, just so that um, I can give you the we can give yeah. you the exact location. That's fine. Um, that's not going to be put out publicly. Yeah, no, that's fine. We can do that. Provide the notice. Yeah, I mean we have a we have a um, a database where we're tracking perfect all of this. We know who the customer is. We know where the tree is. We have tags on them now that can identify them specifically. So yeah, okay, terrific. All right. Yeah, but I mean, I'll leave you my name and information, and if you have any questions, please call me there. I don't have any questions. I want to write it down and say it on the third. And you'll get us, yeah. you'll get us that letter sooner rather than later oh, okay. that we can send. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Do you have a security yeah. personnel uh, <laughs> security detail when you come to the yeah. castle? Yeah, I think that idea. <laughs> so far, we haven't needed it. Luigi. Yes. You were on those phone calls. Ashley? Luigi I is on all those oh, phones. Oh, are? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is. My apologies. Uh, all right. You may get, you, you may get, you, you know, I'm not saying you need security detail, but uh, you may get some people that are not happy. Yeah, yeah. we expect that. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just like information about when you're coming, absolutely. be able to let everybody know, and no surprises. So okay. far, yeah. all the yeah. pilot programs we've done, we've hit no resistance. Um, people are happy that we're coming. The process is better. Um, we're not leaving evidence of, you know, massacres going through the woods and massacring the area. Um, so, so far, so good. We've learned. Um, we've taken what we've learned, what we've heard from all the municipalities, and uh, we put it to use. Well, why not, from a policy position and just for PR position, even why don't you make a gesture of replacing some to a tree bank or planting trees or green to? It, to it's. I have to tell you, it's it's something that we have to consider. We, we, like I said, we're moving towards more vegetation management. But if you talk about management, it's also replacing that. But the I, only I thing is where, where that comes into play also is that we are a rate payer based company, right? So what we want to do is make our equipment efficient and safe. It really, in our rate case, does not have replacing trees because it doesn't add to our system at all. You follow what I'm True, saying? True, but there's a lot of things Absolutely. corporations and people do in life yes, that doesn't add to the bottom line. Right. And if, I saw your decision. I understand that. Yeah, right. What Kynet right. used to do years ago, and you guys probably know, I, I found it online. If, if somebody went paperless, they would donate, it may have been a dollar or something, but they would donate money to a tree fund right. if people went paperless. So that is saving you actually money, and it, it, it gives you the, it gives the uh, you send me the right message. Also. I think we're, we're open to all those ideas. I think it's, you know, the further we go with incorporating this into the overall program every year, we're going to talk about those things. And get more people who want to comply because they'll know that there's going to be something. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we, 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 may, we may earmark that and, you know, we'll sure. have to go to the PSC and talk about it and see what they think. And, right, exactly. You know, but uh, it's definitely something we can think about. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We love Cut Ed, no matter what. <laughs> Thank you. Love what you may hear. Love what you may hear. Love might be strong. It's a little strong, love. Thank you. Right, right. You too. If I could do it. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Okay, but you'll give me the information so I can circulate it. We will. Great. Thank you. All right. Okay, terrific. All right, Allie, you're up. Sorry to keep you waiting. Nick, are there municipalities that require utilities to donate? Hey, how are you? How are you? No, but I've heard of them. I did. I'll get back to you on that. Okay. I feel like I read about that recently where there were municipalities requiring Con Ed to donate to tree funds. 100? Which we should look into if. So you guys got some big, beautiful stones. Well, yeah. these may not be the... Uh, may not be the ones. So I will just give a little background. So Allie and Stacy have been doing a lot of work. 
and uh, checking out rocks and other memorials and, and things like that. And, you know, I think they're, you know, would like to use the space by the gazebo for the memorial. And we have a landscaper who's willing to donate his services and willing to, you know, work on, um, what do you call it again? The, uh, the survey for not the survey. We need to get in the survey. Uh, right, a, a rendering. A rendering. An artistic right. rendering. So, but so we don't want to waste all this time doing it if we don't know if we're going to get. Just so she basically wants to get permission to use it. Space for the gazebo. So the the proposed site would be on the brook side of the gazebo, and the proposed memorial would consist of a weeping cherry tree, which we felt would symbolize the sadness and the suffering experienced during the Holocaust. A rock would sit at the base of the tree, kind of an organic, aesthetically pleasing rock that would have a plaque on it, engraved, um, describing, explaining the memorial. Um, a bench would sit to the side of the tree, offering really a place for peaceful contemplation in this really nice, you know, the gazebo is such a beautiful piece of our town, and kind of behind it is very a very peaceful spot. So we really, we did, we really loved that site. Um, as Rob just said, the tree and the rocks and the building of the creation of this little bench would be donated by Manzer's Landscaping um, and along with their landscaping <coughs> services. Where, where are we looking? I'm sorry. Where okay, so, so I apologize. So um, South Greeley Avenue is on the bottom. Oh, I know what the, I know okay, where we are. Okay, so this is the gazebo. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, and, and I apologize. So this is... Um, the stream is on your right hand side. It's right here. It's right here. Yeah. Okay. So where are you proposing the? Like where is the stream? It's here. This is the base. It's, it's by where it says 307. 307. Where um, we had our pictures taken. Oh, you were running with Victoria. Mm. It's by. It's, That's just like where it says 307. Like, oh, I know. I know where he is. I'm, I'm just sorry. I couldn't put this where we put it. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. Um, the other reason we love the this site um, is. We felt like it would function so beautifully to hold the annual memorial and remembrance service with the gazebo so close to the site. In bad weather, yep. you would still be able to hold hold the hold the service. Um, also, while survivors are still alive, and as we all know, they're really elderly. Again, the gazebo just creates like a nice place for an easy access. Parking is really easy because you have Bell right across the street. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that's the proposal of, you know, of, of why we like that site. Um, the fundraising for this memorial, again, as we said, the landscaping services, the tree, the bench, the rock, this gentleman has really been incredible and said that he would um, donate a lot of this. Um, we do, we, I spoke to him last week, I do feel like putting together an artistic rendering that he typically does for jobs like this would be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, we would need to pay for that um, and probably pay for some of some of this. Um, we, in the past uh, couple months, I've been also working on the creation of a club at the high school and the name of the club is Enough. Um, it stands for Educate Now on Understanding Genocide and Hate. And the kids who will be running the club could do the fundraising. Um, I, there is a something called the Worldwide Daffodil Project based in Atlanta. And what they had, their mission is, they are trying to, there were one and a half million children killed in the Holocaust, and they are trying to plant bulbs worldwide, uh, da, sorry, plant daffodils to for each child killed and they are up to about 600,000 daffodils planted. I did reach out to them and what they do is if you they obviously only do this in Holocaust and Memorial sites they um, if they you know you decide to do this with them and they decide to do this with you the first 250 bulbs they actually give to you for free along with that they give you a whole uh, array of gardening and planting and how you do that. Um, they also make a uh, memorial plaque that you would display in that daffodil garden. And then they ask you over the next two years to purchase bulbs from them at 30 cents a bulb and you purchase a minimum of 250 additional bulbs, which is just $75. So what I thought was in the fall, 
the student club could have a table at community day. They could sell the bulbs, the ones that we buy, not the ones that we get for free, um, as a way to fundraise for the memorial. Then we can also have a multi-generational town planting day in October, because you plant the bulbs in October, and that could be just an incredible way to kind of get everyone now to this memorial, people know about it, and then in the spring, when we have the service, um, that is when the daffodils are blooming and the cherry tree is in bloom as well. Actually, they won't quite yeah. exactly match up. Right. Not exactly, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but they... I was but, actually going to say, if, you're gonna, if we are going to invest in the rendering, um, we're not asking may, the town to pay for it. I mean, it's, right. it's we only would, we would, bucks. We would privately pay for it. No, no, that's fine. Um, I, I don't even have a problem with the town paying for it. Um, what I was going to suggest you do is perhaps talk to them a little bit about the timing of the blooming so expectations are set since it might be the variety of cherry tree that you buy. Yes. No, that's okay. Right. Yeah. And then the second thing is, um, you know, 750 bulbs, one of the nice things about them is, you know, they kind of, if they're taken care of properly, they, they will go thicker over time. And so you may want to ask him to um, kind of give you, like, how he wants the swath of bulbs to be planted so that... <coughs> right, when we're out there planting, we're not just, will, you know, willy-nilly, right. like, well, that's planting them everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and then um, the other thing yeah. is, uh, yeah. if he could just take a look at the existing plantings that are out there, because the shade from the cherry tree may actually require that certain things are placed with more shade tolerant plantings on the northwest corner of that property. Yes, absolutely. So, Yom Kippur is October 9th? It, it is. Yeah. It might be a nice time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. To do what? To plant the bubbles. I mean, we, yeah, it's not probably not on Yom Kippur, but around. Around, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, it's a Wednesday, so mm -hmm. it's a Friday. I don't think it's a stream. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They can't. Sh they can't come on our side of the stream. Yeah, I've raised that issue before. Yeah. But the shell is not going to be the so You still have that stream and a lot of space just, after this, before, mm -hmm. the, you know, between the. This memorialism with a stream is a lot of space in the shell. The shell station is expanding a little bit. But it's going to be on the other side of the stream. So it's not going to. I mean, the shell station will be closer to the stream. But there's still a lot of space from the stream on our side of the gazebo to where, to where the memorial is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we could potentially ask them to do a little yeah. screening yeah, yeah, yeah. on their side. I actually went and looked because for some reason in my head I thought this area was smaller than it is. But it's actually a pretty nice size. Yeah, it's a nice size and I think it would be a nice We're going to get a full map of this so that you'll be able to actually go out there and figure out exactly where we are. Okay. Now, something I, I wasn't going to raise, but it, since this is going so well, I'm going to raise it. <laughs> you know, the possibility, I know you guys mock me for town committees. But uh, just me, and this is and this is Allie's idea. So, so it was, mine. Was, me. Mine, <laughs> but, <laughs> never. What is it? The Holocaust and Human Rights Commission, commission. as opposed to committee, um, and, and they would be in charge of. So we we talk about this programming at the gazebo, not just the yearly event, but also if you have a speaker, um, if we have movies, um, it would be this this group that would do it and work on it and work with the high school and ed education. Like Allie actually put on a great program. Uh, Last month, when she brought in a speaker, a Holocaust survivor to the to the high school, to the school. Yeah, last week, in fact, I brought um, a survivor to the eighth graders who are just beginning their unit on World War II, and then actually on June 10th, Monday, June 10th, a survivor is coming to speak to the tenth graders who just completed their unit on World War II and their project with genocide studies. So it's really a primary source to have them, you know, and this is. I don't know, I did post it on Facebook, but um, the woman who came, who is almost 90, gave a three-minute opening remark and started with, you are the last generation that are going to be able to hear us speak. I mean, I, I, and what she then in, in three minutes said, I, I couldn't have even scripted it any better, but just the responsibility that they have being this last generation hearing them. Um, Can you bring that to the... A wider audience. But well, that's the goal. Well, the, that's like the goal. Have them at chat pack or that's, something. That's the goal, and that's why this listen. commission really would be beneficial because um, 
I think that was the feedback that I've heard. All the parents were saying, we want to come. Well, they're not invited to an eighth grade right, 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 presentation right. at 1030 in the morning, or should, they shouldn't be, um, but they want to. Mm -hmm. And Somers, by the way, has one already. So some of these communities are actually doing this because this is the last generation to uh, do but it's a, but it's a no it's it would be holocaust and human rights this would be called the holocaust and human rights it could say education commission i mean i was kind of modeling it off of um something that exists in white plains but it it is it's really surrounding education and awareness and you know the obviously we all know the increase in hate crimes across the globe locally in our nation um, in schools um, in schools in particular hate crimes have increased um, over the past two years 25% I mean it's a huge number um, and it's not just it is anti-semitism it's not just it's it's tolerance it's anti bigot it's everything so this just comes at a moment in time when it's so important and not just to be reactive to something that happened, mm -hmm. but what I'm trying to say is let's be proactive, let's teach them, let's build their characters, build these students' characters, and then across our town, across our community, same thing. I mean, just get, just keep the awareness. You know, I'm, I'm just wondering, so we have an, an organization um, that's funded through grants called Newcastle United for Youth. Uh, I work with um, them and I, I would love to connect you with them because this is all part of it, just, just building strength of character. You know what, I have connected with them, I will tell you Excellent. why, because this, this past year I actually chaired the um, Sophomore Safe Driver event, and in order to do, we were at the woman and I who mm -hmm. chaired it, we were asked to kind of re, I don't say use the word recreate, but just rejig it a little bit. Um, right. The attendance had been low over the past mm -hmm. few years, so we met with the women of Newcastle United for Youth who were amazing, and they did help us, and it was really successful. So, But I, and I did speak to them, um, I think prior to speaking to you in February, so they do know about this. Because that, it would be a, a really nice collaboration, and the, you know, the, 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 the mission is so closely aligned. I think what their concern at the moment, mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak for them totally, but they are so focused on substance abuse mm -hmm. that yeah. there wasn't as that this was yeah. more. Um, they sort of have to be. No, 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 no. Like, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. is definitely, yeah. and, and they're um, they're funded specifically for, for that. that purpose. Right. But the whole bullying and um, tolerance is all part and parcel of that. Um, and it's very difficult to like separate it out because yes. you know it's almost cause and effect sort of Yeah, thing, no, so. and we did talk about. There's also like the interfaith council, yes, and, and so we yes. did. We talked about that. Okay. Um, there's so many pieces, mm -hmm. um, but that was the one thing okay, that good. as long as you're yes. aware of that. Then yes. Yes. There's also a program you could look into, which I don't know if you, right. I, it wouldn't be part of fundraising, but um, I don't know, maybe somehow you can incorporate it, where children, it doesn't have to be children, but they actually adopt a, like a child who died in the yes. Holocaust, both my kids did that, yes. and it's actually pretty um, like impactful. emotional and impactful, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if somehow it's I can get you the name yeah, of that. It's twin, no, no, it's not twinning. It's um, okay. Will you? Yeah. I will get it to you. Okay. You know what Ivy said is something I mentioned to you also, Ali. I just say it. Um, we just have to also be careful that we don't overlap with the Inclusion and Diversity Committee, and we can look at their mission, and we can look at the mission of. I just think you might you find know. a lot of people on that committee who are interested in right, being right. a part I of know. this and coming forward. Well, I don't mean it in a negative way, but yeah. in the sense that we just want to make sure that everybody has a clear. It's going to be very tailored. Yeah. It's going to be very specific. Yeah. It's going to be very specific. Yeah. Right. 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 And by the way, this is just a little thing. This rock, Allie didn't love this rock, let's be honest. <laughs> Wait, which one? <laughs> a little flat. It's a little flat. It's not very good. So we may have found a better rock. If you look at, I'll tell you the most beautiful rock I ever saw on my entire life. Okay. It, in a similar situation to this, uh, absolutely yeah, it's breathtaking. Um, and it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there was an old cemetery up in Maine, in Paris, in Maine. I can see. see. It, was sort of, it was sort of going up on a hill and it overlooked the presidential range, you know, and had all these things from like 16, whatever. Somebody had gone in and gotten sort of a natural formation of a rock completely flecked with mica. And so what ended up happening is when the sun hit it, the rock kind of came alive and glittered. 
And I've seen people do it sometimes with like amethyst quartz or something, so it's not, it doesn't look necessarily like a grave. Right. But well, at the same time, it has the solidity, yeah. and it kind of, um, I would say, kind of doesn't sort of have this box of definition around it. It allows people to maybe, uh, what I was going to say is, put their own thoughts into the symbolism yeah. of what it actually means. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we haven't found our, our rock yet. <laughs> and I say that in the, in the most serious way, if you can imagine. But I did. I visited. You visited many rocks? I did visit. I visited rocks last week. But I think yeah. if you go online and go to sort of like gemological yeah. rock formations okay, or something like that, I mean, it might cost more because they could be surprised, but maybe not because... And one more thing real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. Ali, you had another good idea, which was to incorporate the, the kids, to the high school group, into coming up with a quote so, to, okay, put, so, to put on the, uh, on the rock. So on this rock, I thought of two things that we could, we'll have the plaque, and I thought it would be important on the, uh, the first part of the description to describe what the memorial is and why we felt it was important to make it. And on the second part of the plaque would be a, a, an existing quote describing something, you know, something about the Holocaust. And that second part of the plaque, this quote, I think the, this Greeley Club, as their first um, back-to-school event, would be to have not an essay contest, but a contest within the student body to ask the students to come up with an existing quote. Not a quote that, that they're writing, but an existing quote with maybe a three to five, you know, sentence essay, parody, you know, short essay, explaining the significance to them. Yeah, yeah. That's great. With, the, with the town committee, also we can have some student members. Just like they do with yeah. STOP and with yeah. Sustainability Advisory right. Board. The company's yeah. called Remember Us. Remember Us. Okay. So the goal is to give kids a huge role because yeah. they are the generation that's seen them. Yeah, and un unfortunately, I did, I went to many Yom HaShoah events in, over this past month, and I just kept noticing the average age of the people there are not just survivors, are just the people that are there and are interested in remembering are really old. And it's so important to really engage our, our kids because it's, it's just, they're not going to be around. Okay. okay. This was Thank really you. impressive. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. 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 Thank Towns are being asked to pass this resolution. I did actually, Joe, the one you have in the packet, it's, it's the uh, the one I amended. Whoops, sorry. It's, um, wait, the way I did is add Town of Newcastle. Okay. And, uh, I think I did eliminate the last sentence. Which, um, 131. 131. Mm -hmm. 131. Thank you for numbering, by the way. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's so, so much better. Oh. <laughs> I suggest it. It was a great suggestion. Thank oh, thank you. You're thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> I'm going to change your numbers next time. Okay. There. <laughs> well, it took us long enough. How long? <laughs> yeah, so basically, I, sh I should have uh, sent the other good one, but it's basically uh, it's essentially the same thing. Let me see if I can just find it real quick. The next slide now. We'll be recorded all the guys. So, are we uh, approving it tonight? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. yes. But what do you want to okay. move something or no? No, I just wanted to show you guys what the, the original version and what, I mean, it's essentially the, the, the same. I just didn't want to, uh, uh, I, uh, they actually, she asked that we, we don't make too many changes to it, so I didn't. Um, I'm just trying to find the email. From I, I just thought the change to say, is, it, is yours very different? Like to say you should wear orange on the first Friday of June. Friday of June, but then they have 2019. Isn't it every June? But we would probably do this again. Yeah, we Why? do it every year. Oh, I got the original one. On June 7, 2019, on the first Friday sure of June, okay. as the fifth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. So the, the, the three main changes were one is it refers to mayors. 
you know. So. <laughs> okay, so I didn't put wow. supervisor. I made it to town in Newcastle, right? Okay. The other, yeah, and yeah. then I, there was a couple of other. So that's pretty much it. And then the last sentence, which we can put back in, but I, I did take it out. It basically says again. It, it, it ends with the mayor. The mayor of the city of so and so declares that Friday. In June 7, 2009, the National Gun Aware then says, I encourage all citizens to support their local community's efforts to prevent the traffic, tragic offense of effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Okay, so I guess we can add it, but it just seems a little it's bit to honor and value human lives. I just thought it was, it was like a yeah. close controversy. I just thought it was weird to say we declare the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day. I don't know, I, I just feel like it's... It's the fifth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Right, that makes more sense then. Okay, Unless then you want to say, say the that. first well, Friday in, in June. June. Unless you want to say the first Friday, Friday in June yeah. is National Gun yeah. Violence yeah. Awareness Day. In New and June 7th, 2019 <laughs> will be the fifth such day or something like that. Like, sure. it just was written weird. But I'm all for it. You put back in that sentence? I don't know why I took it out at that time, to be honest with you. I, it's, uh, again, I encourage all citizens to support their local community's efforts. We support. We. We. Yeah, we support. It would be, we, we encourage. encourage all residents to support efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Yes, it's perfectly fine. I don't think anyone can really be too... Uh, why, would that be, why would that be controversial? Well, it's, it was... I, it was also because this one is saying to support their local community, so I just felt they was like, no, it wasn't okay. really. No, I like the as rewritten. Yeah, rewritten it makes it, it's better rewritten. It was the way it was here. It was like, okay. it was more from the organization right. speaking to the mayor as opposed to the resolution speaking oh, to, the, us to the, the mayor. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, Rob, you want to read the other supervisor? Yeah. Hear. This whole resolution? <laughs> yeah. Give it a try. Oh, oh God. Oh, God. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Here we go. Wait, but didn't we just amend? Didn't we make some changes? No, we, this is the changed version, right? No, yeah. exactly. No, we just paragraph. discussed some to changes, to too. Nope. Isn't it all to like the last paragraph? Like, they're now though? there for... No, it's just no, the last it's paragraph. the next that page. Yeah, it's just the last paragraph. Just the last yeah, paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made other changes, but that's just changing yeah, mayors in town of Newcastle. And we're going to put the paragraph back. All right, so this proclamation declares the first Friday. Oh, well, correct me if I, if we're going to make it generic, right? We're going to make it generic for everybody. Yes, that's right? what I'm yeah. saying. So this proclamation declares the first Friday in June, that one yes, is good. That's right. To be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the town of Newcastle to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence and declare that we as a country must do more to reduce gun violence. Whereas every day, 100 Americans are killed by gun violence, and on average, three are. There are nearly 13,000 gun homicides every year, whereas Americans are 25 times more likely to be killed with guns than people in other high-income countries, and whereas protecting public safety in the communities we serve is our biggest, is our highest responsibility, and where our support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand-in-hand -hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories, and whereas in June 2013, Adaya Pendleton, a teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade and was tragically shot and killed just three weeks, just weeks later, should now be celebrating her 22nd birthday. And we're asked to help honor Hadiyah and the 100 Americans whose lives are cut short and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings every day, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 7, 2019, the first Friday in June, as the fifth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Where the idea was inspired by a group of Adia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. They chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods, and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June, on, let's say, the, uh, on the, the first, first Friday, Friday in June. June to help raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas, by wearing orange on the first Friday in June, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas, we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to, keep, to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, be resolved that we declare the first Friday in June to be National Gun Awareness Day one more sentence. Gun violence awareness. Awareness. Oh, gun violence awareness day. I encourage all residents to 
to support efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Christine, I'll send you the uh, Great, thank amended. You. Okay. That's it, and we'll take a picture at some point. Okay. So, I uh, move to uh, move to executive session. Executive session to advise the council of contracts. Personnel. Okay. Personnel. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Should we take a picture now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> We're back. Somebody appreciates me, right? Okay. Welcome back, everybody. So uh, let's see what we got here. Think we are talking about proposed King Greeley Sanitary Sewer District expansion. Uh, Discussion. Let's discuss sewers. Oh, um, sorry, I thought we were up to resolution. My bad. You just skipped the whole thing? <laughs> I just skipped wow. the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why you said it. It's like we're done. Um, so, um, there's a memo in the file. We have a request from someone who has a failing um, septic system. Um, who was within the Sawmill Sewer District to connect to a, uh, the King Greeley Sewer. Um, and so there will be a, a petition that will be coming along with maps. Um, and um, basically it's, um, it's something that we've, we've done before. Um, the new house is on King Street, and there's this new development within the King Greeley Sewer District. Um, some parcels are actually in it and connected to the sewer district. Some parcels are actually pay the tax, but are on septic. Well, what, my bottom line is, why wouldn't we allow them if they're in the she, district? She is, but she has to petition in. And that way, once we get all the paperwork, she's it's included in the tax win. bill. Yeah. So we'll wait for the rest of the And there's no, um, just because it's been mentioned in the past, there's no approval from the controller required because no money is being spent to uh, by the town or by the taxing district to fund the improvements that's being paid by the property owner who wants to extend it. Right. Okay. The is fixing their right. Super. Yes. Okay. Next. Um, okay, we're back to the wetlands law. So, um, there, um, there were recommendations by Steve about the wetlands law. Um, yep. There was concern that the shed was um, too large, and so we've reduced it down in size. Um, um, yeah, it's reduced down from 200 square feet to 120, which mirrors the New York State building. Okay. 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 Uh, the next is we um, we found out that there was actually an ambiguity in our law regarding how to measure the height of a fence, so we'd like to just be able to clarify. I know. It's kind of obvious. <laughs> and yet, I think we should do it in hands. I think we should do it in hands and do horses. That should be the official no, there was measurement an issue. in hands. There was an issue, so we need to clarify it, so here it is. Right. Okay, um, it has um, come to our attention that um, recreation has um, received authorization for all part-time employees that they hire, including uh, campers, that is going to be coming shortly. Um, but they did not receive, um, uh, basically, um, authorization for the independent contractors. Um, last year, Labor Council went through and actually corrected a mistake that we had been doing. We had been treating all of our um, uh, non-full-time employees as part-time employees, when in fact some of them were part-time employees and some of them were independent contractors. Mm -hmm. So now that we've set that straight, um, Recreation still needs authorization to be able to pay them. Authorization for payment can only come from the town board. So we realize that there had been a gap in our approvals. So this is our efforts to close that gap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then we've also camp? got camp That's staff. So cute. Excuse me? Yeah, mini warrior <coughs> camp. Natasha does really that. really cute. <laughs> and then um, we have our blanket approval to hire for our campers, our counselors rather. Um, that's attached to it as well, which we do every year. So we're all squared away. We've got our proclamation on us. We did gun violence already, so bad yeah. law. Um, 
New York State Fed Board requested the county um, for an email in support. That was the letter that, just to sign that letter, this resolution to, uh, you can need the resolution, but just basically to uh, approve the letter. Okay. We have a, that the SIBs were recommended. We mm -hmm. Great. Um, and um, we have a request for um, our uh, contract extension with Olmstead, which is something that Steve normally handled. So I was very appreciative that, we, uh, uh, that Mark stepped in and just um, reminded us that this needs to be done. All okay, right. This is quickly. Right. Interviewing for the position tomorrow, which is pretty great. So can we just have a, oh, I was going to say before we move on, did we, did we talk about the numbers yet? No. no. Okay. Before we move on to resolutions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Um, okay, and then we go on to um, we're going to have a payment of claims. Um, there is uh, just a, a service agreement um, for primary disinfection at the Millwood Water Treatment Plant, mm -hmm. and also um, filter media at the Millwood Water Treatment Plant. Just one of the many. Okay. Numbers. Okay, so I'm just looking at this and I have a couple questions. Um, one is, has Boswell taken care of the health department? We issues? met with the health department um, last uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, the, the 15th. Um, we had a meeting with them. Uh, we came to an agreement that Boswell would um, retest the first three manholes. Uh, the manholes that had not been tested above the joint for the sanitary sewer. Um, that's going to be tested when there's some additional work that has to be um, done by EOQ. It will be done at night. Um, and it's going to be done before June 25th, which is our adjourn date for the Department of Health. Boswell will then certify the results of that and give it to the Department of Health. And that should resolve the outstanding issues with the department. What is the All of them, right? Um, you need a, um, a, the least amount of flow. Uh -huh. going and we're not paying extra for that. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Good. And there was there was the sanitary, and there was one other. Was it the water? There was also water. So I asked them about water. Um, John Caswick is supposed to provide updated as built to the county uh, for the water approval, and uh, we're waiting for him to do that. That $250,000 Well, okay, I just want to double check because I'm looking at this right Let's here, see. okay? Um, Which one? The last payment to Boswell was on June, June 1st, 1st mm -hmm. 2018. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then what I have on this back side is a not to exceed of 211000 from 422 to 2019. Right. Yes. So that's for the work that they're currently doing. Currently so doing. we withheld the payment, which is two. Oh, no, I understand. I just want to make sure there's no gap between Bless you. Bless you. the existing $1 million dollar estimate for them plus the $211,000 outlined that covers them. No. Yeah, we have not received any additional building from them. Actually, I think it's with Ed. They had some tweaks on the contract we were going back and forth with them. And anything with ELQ and some of their. No, that really should be discussed in executive, but that's good. And is that something we'll get an update on next week? Yes. It's a work in progress. In the meantime, work in progress. <coughs> The lamp posts were installed on Lower King. Yes, I noticed. I drove much past to my surprise because I really evening. thought that they poured the con they put the lamp posts in after they poured the concrete. And I'm glad I texted uh, Susan Hustle, like I told her lamp posts are coming next week. They probably were installed already. No, we, we, <laughs> we literally had the conversation <laughs> like 15 minutes ago. I texted at five o'clock tonight. Like, oh, they're probably they're up already. <laughs> all I noticed were all the cones. There's That's a kind of awareness thing. Yes. 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 So I move to approve the payment of claims in line of $242,104.24 listed on the summary pre-check writing report and detail voucher detail before each period of May 21st, 2019. Checks will be issued to mail each claimant listed on Wednesday, May 22nd in the year of our supervisor, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to accept the proposal from, what, like that, Xylem Water Solution. Mm -hmm. 
USA incorporated the amount of $12,213 to perform preventative maintenance of the primary disinfection system at the Miller Water Treatment Plant for the period of May 2019 to May 2020. Second. Well in favor? Aye. 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 I move to authorize the purchase of filter media for the Miller Water Treatment Plant as per quote from 219 RJC in the amount of $15,398 and zero pennies from CEI filtration. Uh, that's it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to appoint the downtown working group to assist with the Chappaqua Hamlet rezoning project, which will consist of all five town board members, planning board members Bob Kirkwood, Tom Curley, Greg Zanzari, as well as architect Bill Spade, and commercial property owners Steve Cavallucci and Randy Catches. Second. Well in favor? Aye. 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 I move to correct the salary for Denise Lombardi, real property appraiser, with the assessor's office to $91,565.33, effective retroactively to February 6, 2019. Second. Well in favor? Aye. Aye. And the next one, are we going forward? The yeah. Changing the hourly yeah. rate? Yeah. yeah. I move to change the hourly rate for Courtney Spath and entered in the court office from $12 an hour to $14 an hour. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 the last one. I move to authorize the highway department within the Department of Public Works to hire two summer health workers. Funds have been allocated for these positions in the 2019 budget. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.